before we get started, I wanted to let you all know that I'll be attending Momocon this year from May 24th to May 27th at the Georgia World Congress Center in Atlanta. This will be my first big convention and also my first time flying to another country by myself, anxieties be damned. So if you'll also be there and happen to stumble across me buying too much merch, singing karaoke or waiting in line to meet Disney voice actors, feel free to say hi. Anywho, on with the video. For fans of an animated series, there are few things in this world more exciting than a cinematic adaptation. Getting to see the characters you've watched for years on the big screen with upgraded animation, a wider scope, and an adventure more tense and exciting than anything the show had offered before. Or at least that's how it used to be. Because over the last decade, we've seen a significant decrease in big budget features based on our favourite shows, and when they do happen, they don't make nearly as big of a splash as they once did. For us to truly understand why these films have become such a rarity, we first need to take a step back and examine the history of this practice and why it became commonplace for a while. Which is another way of me saying I hyperfixated on this topic and watched a bunch of movies based on shows and now I'm gonna tell you about them. Now the earliest motion pictures based on cartoons I could dig up were a duology of films produced by Hanna-Barbera in the 60s, based on the Yogi Bear and Flintstones franchises respectively. I feel I don't have to give significant background on these shows. Yogi is a smarter than the average bear bear who comes up with convoluted plans to steal picnic baskets with his best friend Boo Boo while avoiding Jellystone's Ranger Smith, and the Flintstones are a modern Stone Age family who have a gay old time. We all get the picture. First release was 1964's Hey There, It's Yogi Bear, in which Yogi, after becoming too much of a nuisance to Jellystone, almost gets transferred to a zoo in San Diego, before tricking another bear into switching places with him as he slips into the woods, leaving everyone else to believe that he's gone. Cindy Bear, who has feelings for Yogi, attempts to go after him, only to be abducted by a circus. Now Yogi and Boo Boo must leave the familiar confines of Jellystone in order to rescue her. Meanwhile, in 1966's The Man Called Flintstone, Fred swaps places with a secret agent who looks identical to him named Rock Slag after the spy is severely injured. The reason for the switcheroo is a new villain on the loose named the Green Goose, who has a weapon of mass destruction. So the fate of the entire world rests on a bumbling rock quarry worker with anger issues. However, he hasn't been told about the severity of the situation, simply believing he's getting an all-expenses-paid trip abroad for his family and all he has to do is collect a bird, without telling anyone, not even his wife. So the Flintstones end up travelling all over the world so Fred can search for the Green Goose while keeping his loved ones none the wiser, which gets progressively more ridiculous. Hanna-Barbera is not a studio known for its pretty visuals, so I was curious to see how much of an upgrade these cinematic adventures would receive. Both these movies look significantly better than their TV counterparts, though I was surprised how much more polish and spectacle was found in Hey There, It's Yogi Bear. The characters feel so alive, despite still utilising that limited movement the studio is known for, yet it's the backgrounds that are the true star attraction. The environments of Jellystone contain so much depth that gives them a greater cinematic feel, allowing for way more atmosphere than was possible in the show. In comparison, the man called Flintstone doesn't look nearly as impressive. The characters have a bit more movement, and the backgrounds are occasionally quite detailed. Significant effort was put into to making Bedrock feel like a lived-in place rather than just a collection of looping shapes in the background. Though there's still plenty of that here, which I'm conflicted on. On one hand, it's disappointing seeing a similar quality to the TV series, but a lot of these quirks are an essential part of the show's charm. I was surprised how underwhelming the visuals were here because The Flintstones was a hugely successful series, being the first animated show to air on primetime. So I thought it would be deserving of a bigger budget for a theatrical release, but I guess not. One element of these films I could not have anticipated is that they are both musicals. And again, Yogi handled this element far better in my opinion. The songs are worked organically into the film and often progress the narrative. They're not anything special, but they're fun, energetic, and don't overstay their welcome. The songs in Flintstone lack any sort of purpose and end up feeling tacked on. Like, why did they need to give Pebbles her own song when she does nothing else in the movie? Though the child performer they got is at least more pleasant to listen to than Fred and Barney. 
Okay, I've kind of been ragging on the man called Flintstone. Is there anything it does better than Yogi Bear? I would say it's paced more consistently, and the plot itself feels more thought out. Hey There It's Yogi Bear has a surprisingly convoluted story that kind of drags it down. By the time they've finished properly setting everything up and the adventure truly begins, the film is half over. I'd argue the selling point of this film is seeing these characters leave the park and explore the outside world, but by the time we finally get to that, the film kind of meanders and becomes a series of hit or miss gags as Yogi and Boo Boo stumble their way through the plot. The further you get into the movie, the less cohesive it starts to come across. Once they save Cindy from the circus and start making their way back home, the movie spends the last 20 minutes struggling to find an ending, especially with them being hunted by law enforcement. The Flintstones knows how to keep things moving and focused. Both these films were made to serve as a series finale to their respective shows, which had wrapped production by then, but the man called Flintstone struggles to reconcile with this and suffers from an identity crisis. It wants to be this satirical spoof of espionage films of that era, while also acting as a send-off to the series. They do include a lot of that prehistoric technology and one-liners the show is known for, and the movie does find time to slow down for some nice tender moments between its characters, namely Fred and Wilma. Despite how little of the film's runtime is spent with the entire family together, they do manage to effectively communicate how much they all love each other. My favourite moment occurs just after Fred is told what is actually going on and he quits because it's too dangerous but the reason he goes back is because he has to save the world so his child can have a future, putting his life on the line. Then we arrive at the darkest hour portion of the film, which comes out of nowhere and doesn't feel earned. The movie has had many opportunities to show how these lies are driving a wedge between Fred and his loved ones, yet it has let him off the hook every single time with no consequences. So the moment when everyone suddenly turns on him has no real build up and barely any resolution. Especially since after this, Wilma and Betty disappear until the final scene and don't factor into the climax whatsoever. Also, the villain's henchmen are very much offensive stereotypes, and they are in this a lot. As for Yogi Bear, despite my criticism of its pacing, it is an utterly charming little film that, when it does finally manage to come to an ending, is able to find some closure for the series. At least until the original continuity would be continued in 1988's The New Yogi Bear Show. If I was forced to pick one of these films to watch again, I would easily choose Hey There It's Yogi Bear for its backgrounds alone. Throughout the 70s and 80s, there weren't that many attempts at adapting a cartoon for the big screen, at least ones that weren't based on a successful toy line. Your Care Bears movies, your He-Man Secret the Sword, your Transformers, etc. While these films do technically fit the bill, I don't think they counted towards the rising trend that would occur in the following decade, simply because of other factors that went into why they were created. Instead, the next true cartoon to feature adaptation was 1987's The Chipmunk Adventure, based on Alvin and the Chipmunks, a globetrotting jukebox musical in which the characters unwittingly become mules in a diamond smuggling operation that despite having some phenomenal animation courtesy of some ex-Disney animators, was by all accounts a financial disappointment. Then 1990 would see two box office flops based on beloved properties. Jetsons the movie, released nearly 30 years after the show's cancellation, was a production nightmare that didn't pay off. But the most disappointing of all was DuckTales the movie Treasure of the Lost Lamp, based on the flagship Disney Afternoon series following the escapades of the adventurous McDuck family. The feature was a massive gamble, being the first ever theatrical release from Disney's television division that they hoped would kickstart a whole series of DuckTales movies. This unfortunately did not pan out, as the film ended up losing the company likely around $20 million. By the early 90s, it seemed like any film based on an animated series was doomed to fail. The only way they could make money was to keep the budget as low as possible, but then people didn't want to see them because they didn't look like something worth seeing in theatres. 
then those that try to wow audiences with their visual spectacle still couldn't get them to want to pay for something that, from their perspective, they got on TV at no extra cost. No matter which path companies chose, these films were in a constant uphill battle that, after a while, didn't feel worth fighting. So other adaptations were either scrapped or were pivoted in rather big ways. For example, A Goofy Movie, a theatrical movie based on the television series Goof Troop, was heavily changed into being its own thing, using few characters from the series and essentially building the world again from scratch. Despite all that though, there was still belief that this venture could be profitable. All it would take is finding the right show to adapt. Rugrats premiered on Nickelodeon in 1991 as part of the original trio of Nicktoons, where it saw decent success, completing a run of 65 episodes, the standard of network television, meaning the channel had enough material to rerun, so they wrapped production. What they hadn't anticipated though was over the next few years, the near constant reruns would give the show a massive popularity boost, so much so that Nickelodeon ordered new episodes, with a fourth season premiering in 1997. With it its popularity only growing, executives would take a chance and greenlight a feature film based on the property, which unbeknownst to anyone, would change the course of history. Released in November 1998, the Rugrats movie followed on from a special episode that revealed Tommy's mother Dee Dee was pregnant, as the film deals with the arrival of the new baby and Tommy's journey to accept his brother, which leads to the babies getting lost in the woods, having to survive rapids, a group of circus monkeys and a wolf while trying to find a way home. The main things that stand out about the Rugrats movie in comparison to every other adaptation we've looked at thus far is scope and heart. While things could get out Landish now and then, Rugrats was mainly a very simple and down-to-earth show, with a majority of stories being confined to a single location, the Pickles house. But removing the characters from that very defined setting, opening them up to the outside world, makes the film feel larger than life and beyond anything you'd find in the series. And that grander scale allows the film to really push these characters and challenge them. Of those original Nicktoons, Rugrats was always the most real in how it would often sidestep its premise about the comical ways babies misunderstand the world around them to deal with hardships of the human experience, mostly helped by how much effort was put into making the adult characters multi-dimensional and just as, if not more, entertaining than the kids. And that sobering dose of reality is present in the film, which is mainly found in Tommy's journey of learning to accept this new addition to his family, which brings about the most tragic and heartwarming moments in the narrative. Then there's the way the film handles the parents, with them maintaining all the qualities that made them endearing in the show, while also involving them in the story a lot more by having them react realistically to the situation. Most of Rugrats only happens because these people are very bad at supervising their children, allowing them to sneak away and have these fun misadventures. But since this film is essentially trying to up the ante from the series by breaking it entirely, this time around the parents become fully aware of their missing kids and desperately search for them. Then you have the visuals. The movie was the first Rugrats production to be animated digitally rather than with the standard cell animation found on the show, maintaining the iconic wonkiness of the drawings while also looking far more clean. And while the extra shading and greater sense of depth are lovely, what truly takes my breath away is the cinematography. Because Rugrats is a show about toddlers mostly told from their perspective, the episodes could often get very creative in terms of their shot composition, which could be fascinating or gross or fascinatingly gross. The feature adapts that visual language flawlessly with an added cinematic flair, the highlight of which being the runaway reptile sequence. The Rugrats movie became the first attempt at adapting a cartoon for the silver screen that truly took advantage of the change in format and budget to create something that felt very true to the spirit of the show, while also cracking it open to mould an adventure that was worthy of being shown in theatres, which would leave a lasting impact in the years that follow 
evident from the box office numbers alone. It goes without saying, the film was a huge success, blowing every previous film to TV adaptation out of the water. On a budget of 24 million, the film was able to gross over 100 million domestically, becoming the first non-Disney animated film to ever achieve such a milestone. The warm reception of the movie was a testament to the power of Nickelodeon's brand synergy at the time, because with all other previous attempts at this, there was never a connection between the show and the film. No episode of DuckTales set up Treasure of the Lost Lamp, and the Chipmunks movie had no lasting effect on the show, giving people even less reason to see them. Nickelodeon made the Rugrats movie required viewing and ensured everyone knew about it. Paramount Pictures and Nickelodeon Movies invite you to meet the newest Rugrat in the Rugrats movie, arriving November 20th at theaters everywhere. The only way you were gonna get to see Tommy's new sibling was getting your butt to the theater, and it paid off handsomely, with the film receiving not one, but two sequels in the years that follow. With the overwhelming success of the Rugrats movie, suddenly every TV network was scrambling to get their most popular characters on the big screen to varying success. Some films perfectly understood the assignment, creating a grand story with massively improved visuals, whereas others took a nearly complete straight-to-DVD movie and just put it in theatres. Even Nickelodeon wasn't immune to this. Now if I went over every movie based on a cartoon released after Rugrats, we'd be here a while. I've also already talked about quite a few of them elsewhere. So instead, I've picked out four more standout examples that I think tell a story of the struggles these adaptations often face and why they have become so scarce. <laughs> In 2002, Cartoon Network released their first, and likely only, theatrical outing based on one of their shows, The Powerpuff Girls Movie. The film is essentially a 70 minute version of the show's opening, depicting the origin story of Blossom, Bubbles and Buttercup in great detail. When Professor Utonium attempts to create the perfect little girls to improve the crime ridden city of Townsville, he accidentally spills in some chemical X, meaning the girls now have superpowers that they don't know how to use properly and end up accidentally destroying the neighbourhood with, making them outcasts. Things aren't helped when they are tricked by the Professor's ex-lab monkey who uses them to carry out his evil plan for revenge and global domination. So now it's up to the girls to make amends by stepping up as heroes to save the world. The reason I was compelled to talk about this film is because the Powerpuff Girls movie is indicative of the main struggle writers encounter when adapting a cartoon into the world of cinema, the pressure to make it as newcomer friendly as possible. This will likely be yet another of my multitudinous unpopular opinions, but I find movies based on shows that are entirely origin stories to be wasted potential. The way I see it, most shows who are given the chance to make a movie, whether it be for TV or theatres, will only get one shot at it. So deciding to set it before anything else limits its potential to be satisfying to longtime fans. A movie that takes place prior to the first episode can't include characters who are introduced later in the timeline and must ignore any changes or developments the protagonists might have gone through. Like, imagine if Cartoon Network had made that Adventure Time movie they kept talking about. The show is at its peak in popularity and people are hyped to see what they can do with this new medium. Then they announce in order to make it newcomer friendly that it's going to be an origin story. Well, I guess Marceline can't be in it, and Ice King will have to be an unsympathetic comedic villain, Princess Bubblegum will have to be written like she was in season 1 with far less complexity. See how infinitely less exciting that becomes? Rant aside, this aspect doesn't do much to drag down the Powerpuff Girls in particular, because it's already quite a simplistic and repetitive show. And they do manage to squeeze in quite a few references to the source material. I mean, the entire plot is arguably an expansion on a season 1 episode. And the film does a fantastic job making you believe the bond between the professor and the girls, which is the heart of the original series. However, the prequel aspect of this film does contribute to another problem. How darn depressing a lot of it is. The Powerpuff Girls is a spoof of superhero media. As such, this film indulges in some realistic implications of the genre by exploring the mass collateral damage the girls cause, causing the town to despise them 
which is very similar to the season 3 episode Town and Out, an episode that is remarkably unfun to experience. Though in terms of art direction, colour choices and atmosphere, it is an incredible watch. The geometric and flat art style doesn't seem suited to cinematic spectacle, but they deliver in the final act, which is when the film feels the most like classic Powerpuff Girls on a grander scale. Ultimately, the film is a flawed yet earnest and visually stunning attempt at adapting the Powerpuff Girls for the big screen, and while it's not my favourite, I had my fun with it and can understand why it has developed a cult following in spite of its financial and critical failure upon its release. If you ask me, everybody in this theatre is a giant sucker, especially you! Movie on the big screen. The Simpsons movie is an excellent film that should have been the definitive ending of the series. I'm not exactly breaking new ground with that statement. It had the seemingly impossible task of adapting one of the longest running and most beloved animated series ever put to screen that to many people had run out of steam by this point, yet it excels in nearly every facet. When Springfield's pollution reaches a crisis level thanks to Homer, the government seals the town away in a dome as the Simpsons are able to escape but are now fugitives as they flee to Alaska to build a new life. But when they learn Springfield is set to be destroyed, the family must return and put an end to the villainous Russ Cargill in order to save their home. What I find so genius about the Simpsons movie is how it uses the longer runtime to expand on conventions you'd expect from a typical episode. For a lot of the movie, Homer is genuinely an awful person, which to many people had become a rather persistent issue with the series, coining the term Jerkass Homer which the movie decides to unpack. In the context of a 22 minute episodic sitcom, these sorts of stories are hampered by quick and easy resolutions in order to restore the status quo. Homer can do unforgivable things and it doesn't matter because him and Marge have to stay together, which the movie is aware of. Marge, in every marriage you get one chance to say, I need you to do this with me. Okay, homie. I'm with you. Mom, you just bought another load of crap from the world's fattest fertilizer salesman. Then when they learn of Springfield's imminent destruction and Homer refuses to help, that is the tipping point the film has been building up to, which is when Marge leaves him. And man, this scene is so masterfully done. Julie Kavner gives such a heart-wrenching performance. The way she trails off and struggles to get out her words, it's so visceral and really sells the idea that this is the end for them. Lately, what's keeping us together is my ability to overlook everything you do. And I overlook these things because... Because? Well, that's the thing. I, j I just don't know how to finish that sentence anymore. Then, to twist the knife a little more, the reveal that she taped over their wedding video before cutting to the ceremony as we see Homer's reflection in the screen, watching it dawn on him that he's lost everything. The Simpsons were famous in the 90s for how they could tug at your heartstrings because of how invested you felt in this family. But this scene is on a whole other level because of how much weight has been put behind it. Watching Marge's frustration and eventual exhaustion with Homer's antics throughout the entire narrative until she reaches her breaking point. The film doesn't hand Homer forgiveness from his family, you see him go through hell and back to earn it. So when him and Marge do finally reunite at the end, it is such a satisfying and beautiful moment. Visually, it's no slouch, and easily the best these characters have ever looked with some moments of amazing character animation. Though there are other occasions where it doesn't really feel like that much of a step up from the series, with the big exception being crowd shots. Every scene set in Springfield is filled with recognisable and sometimes obscure faces that will no doubt delight diehard fans, and the film does take time to give many of the show's iconic secondary characters a moment in the spotlight. But the focus is on the family, 
even if sometimes the film struggles to give them all a purpose. Bart's storyline is another highlight, in which he forms a bond with Flanders and starts viewing him as a father figure, allowing him to see the many ways in which Homer falls short as a parent, brilliantly linking back in with Homer and Marge's story. Hmm, so that's what snug is. Then there's Lisa, who starts the film being the most narratively significant character, with her environmental concerns which were way ahead of the time, and her crusade to clean up Springfield. But then she meets Colin, which becomes her entire focus, meaning she becomes progressively less relevant as the film continues because the writers can't think of anything else significant for her to do. While it's not my favourite cartoon to movie adaptation, I do feel the Simpsons movie earns that title better than any other, in how it uses the tropes and conventions found in the show to build these engaging character studies, reminding folks why these guys are the most successful family on TV and testing the strength of those ties. The show might have been long in the tooth at this point, but this film proved The Simpsons could still be just as heartfelt and funny as it was 10 years ago. And now it's been 18 years since then. I need to go lay down and stare at the ceiling for a while. Best kiss of my life. Best kiss of your life so far. Despite the enormous success of the Simpsons movie, it also marked an end for the golden age of these film adaptations of TV shows, despite there being many shows in the coming years that seemed like shoo-ins to get this treatment. So why did they stop out of nowhere? Well, I think it has to do with the industry's turn away from traditional animation in favour of CGI following the success of Pixar and DreamWorks. Take a look at the list of the highest grossing animated films of all time, and you'll see The Simpsons movie is the most recent solely 2D edition, with the only other entry being the original Lion King. By 2007, hand-drawn animation was viewed in the industry as outdated and box office poison. The Simpsons movie succeeded because it was capitalising on a cultural phenomenon just like Rugrats did, but with each year that passed, it became less and less likely that these ventures could turn a profit. After the Simpsons movie, the next attempt at adapting a cartoon for the big screen arguably occurred in 2015, with the release of the Shaun the Sheep movie and a sequel to the Spongebob movie that despite being animated mostly in 2D, had its marketing fixated on the final act in which the characters go above the surface and become CG, further cementing my point that studios think traditional doesn't sell. It wouldn't be for another few years that we would see an honest attempt to revive this practice. My Little Pony the Movie, released in 2017, is based on the highly successful fourth generation of the My Little Pony toy brand. I know earlier I essentially disqualified movies based on shows based on toy lines, but I have a good explanation for why this one is an exception. I wanted to talk about it. This film also occurred at a point in the show's history where its primary demographic had slightly shifted to capitalising on the adult fandom that had been built around it. The story follows Princess Twilight Sparkle as she prepares to host her first ever festival, only for disaster to strike as the army of the villainous Storm King invades, with Twilight and her friends barely escaping with their lives. With Equestria fallen, the main six and Spike must now venture outside their borders in search of powerful allies who may be able to help them save their world. Now, regardless of what I'm about to say, this movie will always be special to me because this was the first time I got to see one of my favourite shows be given the cinematic treatment. I was three years old when the Spongebob movie was released, and six years old when the Simpsons movie came out, so I never actually got to see either of them in theatres and have only vague memories from around the time of their release. More so Simpsons with the Burger King toys. I was there for My Little Pony the movie though. 
I followed the hype for this film religiously and saw it opening day with a group of my friends who also loved the show and it is one of the best experiences I have ever had at a cinema. That being said, the more years have passed, the more I have come to understand its flaws. I've discussed the struggle writers have with creating something that will be satisfying for longtime fans, yet also newcomer friendly, and this film embodies that as it tries to find this sort of middle ground that doesn't quite work out. In terms of material for fans, most of that is found in the first few scenes, which contain a lot of background cameos from popular characters, many of which had not been seen on the show in years by that point. Then on the other hand, it feels entirely disconnected from the show's continuity despite the drastic impact it would have on its final seasons. And while I loved the background cameos, I do find it odd that that is what most of the show's supporting characters have been reduced to. Starlight Glimmer and the Cutie Mark Crusaders were pretty much part of the show's main cast by then, yet have decided to take a vow of silence for this movie's entire runtime. I think the only ponies from the show besides the main six and the princesses to have speaking lines are Big Macintosh and Party Favor. You forget how weird the names in the show are until you have to write them into a script. To make up for their absence though, we have new characters, played by celebrities, who overshadowed the main voice cast in every aspect of the film's marketing. And the fact they were voiced by celebrities also meant when the show did return, these characters were mysteriously absent. These guys are all very much hit or miss. There's an annoying comic relief sidekick who's only there to prevent the villains from looking too threatening. The Storm King himself has a lot of energy, but falls flat as a villain, especially compared to certain foes from the series. The highlights are Tay Diggs as con artist Kappa, Kristen Chenoweth as bubbly sea pony princess Skystar, and Emily Blunt as the mysterious and complex Tempest Shadow. The other new additions are either fine, but not all that memorable, or the future embodiment of Autism Speaks which makes re-watching this film a whole lot of fun for me. What has me conflicted about My Little Pony the movie is that it manages to adapt most of the strengths of its source material, yet also a lot of the flaws. The main six are incredibly well defined with their contrasting personalities playing off each other beautifully, and there's this real sense of grand adventure and meaningful stakes. Yet there's also a redemption story that feels rushed and a hyper focus on Twilight as her friends are there to act as support or dispense one line. Pinkie Pie, Rarity, and Rainbow Dash have some relevance, mainly in how they are able to inspire several of the characters they meet on their journey, whereas Fluttershy and Applejack are completely left to the wayside. Well, aside from Fluttershy getting the best moment in the movie. You seem tense. Do you want to talk about it? Get it all out. Oh, sorry, our time is up. Bye-bye! <laughs> However, out of everyone, I think Spike is the clear winner here. Spike is a character who for many years was defined by wasted potential. Him being the one boy in the primary cast meant the writers often struggled to find a place for him beyond being the show's punching bag. The film, however, makes great use of Spike, actually including him in on the adventure and giving him some very lovely moments. I love how during the inevitable, yet still well-executed and understandable end of Act 2 fight, Spike is the only one who follows Twilight because he is her oldest friend. As for the animation, this is the biggest overhaul ever seen in one of these movies. Because of the change in animation software, with this film being made in Toon Boom as opposed to Flash, everything had to rebuild, going for this more loose and expressive art style while still being very recognisable. Because of this, the film boasts much more varied character and location design. From the desert city of Kludgetown to the pirate's airship to the vibrant underwater kingdom of Sequestria, the film just keeps throwing these new environments at you, each one rich with detail. The highlight is the action scenes though, which there is a surprising amount of, even if they do also include some CG elements that didn't even look good back then. Then we have the music, something I haven't really gone into with many of these films. One of the true joys of these adaptations is getting to see the creatives from the show be given the chance to work with a wider range of tools, which the music in this film is a fantastic example of. The show's composer Daniel Ingram was able to work with a full orchestra on the musical numbers and score of this film, 
And hearing that iconic style of the show's music be given this level of gravitas and sounding so full, it truly was something magical to experience. They even had some time after they finished the film to record a few songs for the show's eighth season, which was a very pleasant surprise. Oh, and the songs in this film are amazing, but that's par for the course with this series. Even recognising its many flaws in the story and characters, I still can't help but love this movie as a faithful extension of such a beloved TV series that expands a world we thought we knew, while also providing sharp writing, stunning animation, and some great moments for our favourite colourful equines. We've made it. The most recent cartoon to film adaptation, 2022's The Bob's Burgers Movie. Summer has arrived on the wharf as the Belchers all have big plans, only for them to be dampened by a sinkhole opening up in front of the restaurant, effectively killing their business. Which is bad since they are also behind on paying off a bank loan and their wealthy eccentric landlord won't be of any help to them as he has been arrested on suspicion of murder. Now the kids must skip school so they can solve the crime, prove Mr. Fish owed his innocence, and save the restaurant. However, it's not as simple as it appears, as their investigation ends up dragging the entire family into a perilous conspiracy that threatens to destroy everything they hold dear. I'm just gonna get right to the point. I adore this movie. I saw it five times in theatres, the last two of which I was the only person at the screening. In fact, this whole video started ages ago as just an analysis of the Bob's Burgers movie, talking about how masterful it works as an animated film and a companion to the series, demonstrating every quality that has kept the show fresh for over a decade now. And one of the big reasons I love it so much is it doesn't give a damn about appealing to newcomers. This is a film specifically designed for devoted fans with it being built on a foundation of continuity. The story itself is a pseudo-sequel to the season 4 finale, directly referencing events from those episodes. And there's also ties to the season 7 episode Fluise and a few other elements returning from previous stories. I realise I'm making this film sound completely inaccessible for people who don't constantly binge watch the show, but I assure you it does work as a standalone film as well. Even a person without all that prior knowledge will still likely enjoy this movie for the jokes and characters, as well as an engaging and well-told mystery that has its fair share of surprises. What makes this movie rise to the top of the heap in terms of other examples I've discussed is how it perfectly juggles each of the family members, with them all having their own arcs that progress throughout the film and aren't forgotten. And all that is great because the characters are the main driving force of this movie. One of the most endearing and well-known aspects of Bob's Burgers is how unashamedly this family shows their love for each other, even if it's often in their own way which translated flawlessly to the big screen. The movie is chock full of these heart-tugging moments between the characters demonstrating the various ways they can support each other, which is good because the world itself is not kind to the Belchers, which is the thesis of the show. How this family just can't seem to catch a break and have to rely on each other to achieve even the smallest victories. Naturally, a film adaptation would attempt to push this aspect further for the sake of drama, which it is very successful at. Any time in this film where you catch yourself thinking things can't get any worse for the Belchers, then they find a skeleton in the sinkhole. Whoops, now they're being held at gunpoint. Oops, now they're being buried alive. But through all the hardships, you witness how tightly knit they are as a unit and how deeply they all love each other. Bob's story is about them enduring all these hardships while Linda tries to keep him optimistic, which in a lesser story would lead to friction between them but not in this show because they are both two necessary sides of the same coin. Then in Act 3, during the aforementioned Buried Alive sequence, Linda becomes so defeated that she gives up, and Bob has to be the one to encourage her for once. Listen to me. I'm gonna do for you what you do for me. I am not giving up. We are gonna get out of here. I am gonna Linda this. Whoa! Whoa. Dad, are you Fonzie? The film is full of these expertly crafted emotional moments even during the more tense scenes, which is in large part due to Louise, who is the true focus of the film, with her story about wanting to prove to everyone she's brave and capable after she's called a baby at school. 
This film is an exploration of Louisa's insecurities that goes deeper than anything the show had given us by that point, and it truly feels like her journey at the end, despite everyone's stories finding a satisfying conclusion. Moving along to the animation... Do I even have to say it? This film is a visual masterpiece. Bob's Burgers has always had moments where the character animation receives a noticeable bump in quality, and that is pretty much the entire movie, which just elevates it even further. It was a joy seeing a movie like this in theatres again, to a point where movement-wise, I consider this one of the best looking traditionally animated movies. Everything just has so much life and personality to it that easily eclipses anything else we've looked at today. The only thing left to discuss in this movie is the songs, which are the only things I have any complaints about, but even then, they're not really complaints. Hearing there was going to be a Bob's Burgers movie musical, I had built up this expectation the film was going to be stacked with musical numbers, when in reality, there's only four songs in the film, which isn't really much of a musical. However, it's all about the quality, not quantity, and seeing as this is Bob's Burgers, of course the quality was abundant. I enjoy them all, but Sunny Side Up Summer and Lucky Ducks are the standouts for their energy and stunning vocals, and are sequences I go back to time and time again. The Bob's Burgers movie is a continuity-loaded extravaganza that doesn't miss a beat in adapting every single aspect that made the original series so beloved creating a story that could have only ever been told with these characters and some of the most stunning animations seen on the big screen in over 20 years. This movie sets the gold standard for what these cartoon to film adaptations should aim for, and feels like it should have been released back during the heyday of these, as it carries a very similar vibe to the Simpsons movie. Now if only it had been marketed as heavily, maybe it would have actually been successful, but then corporate mergers got in the way and ruined everything as they always do. This is gonna help me with childbirth later in life! <laughs> and that is the rough history of cartoons making the leap from the small screen to the silver screen, from 1964 to 2022. My goal in making this video was to try and figure out why these types of films have become so scarce ever since the 2000s, because from my perspective, I always thought there was this golden age of cartoon to film adaptations that ended out of nowhere, but in examining them closely, I've come to understand these films were rarely profitable. Rugrats, Spongebob and The Simpsons are really the outliers here, only because those films weren't just based on a successful cartoon, they were capitalising on a once-in-a-generation phenomenon. Most of the others in this category either failed at the box office or barely made a profit. They were mostly a trend that came and went because companies couldn't simply just manufacture the success of those other films. However, I don't think that's the reason this practice has mostly died out. The true fault lies with how the rise of streaming has severely changed the media landscape, valuing short-term success over long-term stability, causing significant damage to the entertainment industry which has even bled over into network television. We see this all the time with companies sabotaging their new shows, refusing to properly market them or not allowing them the time they need to naturally grow a following, meaning new shows aren't given the chance to warrant a cinematic adaptation. The last three cartoon movies released in theatres were based off Bob's Burgers, Teen Titans Go!, and My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, all shows that premiered in the early 2010s right before streaming really started to take over. The only way these films can still be released is if they are based on properties from before the landscape changed. So Spongebob movies and the Simpsons movie sequel that'll definitely come out someday. As sad as it is to admit, the days of our favourite Saturday morning shows getting to strut their stuff across theatres worldwide are long behind us, and won't be coming back anytime soon. But every time one of these movies does make it to the big screen, I will be there. When the Bluey movie finally releases in 2027, I will be there. Until next time folks, I've been the Gladden Gladiator, and I'm gonna go watch Rugrats in Paris for the 70th time and bawl my eyes out. As always, a huge thank you to my Patreon patrons such as The Wacky Deli, Torai Matson, Blast Six, Tomb for Thought, and Toby Fangor. 
If you like what I do and want to help support the future of the channel, then supporting me via Patreon is the best way to do so. I also have YouTube membership available. Link and button can be found below. While you're down there, why not leave a comment telling me your favourite movie based on a cartoon? Did you see any of the films I've talked about today in theatres? I'd love to discuss it with you. Thanks so much for watching folks, and I'll see ya real soon.